Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the concluding part of this series of Economies and Industries show. But the response to them has been fantastic, so we will definitely return to the subject in 2024, I expect. Anyway, today, Wendy Goldman returns to talk about the Soviet industries and the human cost of moving them away from the front and et cetera, et cetera. She's the co-author of Fortress, Dark and Stern, and links to that book are in the description below. Uh, where, in fact, all the information you need uh, when you visit World War II TV is all down there. Links to websites, links to merchandise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Without further ado, I'll bring Wendy in. Good afternoon, Wendy. How are you today? I'm good. And thank you so much for bringing me on again. Well, I'm glad to have you. And I mean, as I said in that top of the show there, the response this week has been really gratifying. And I was just saying to you, you know, that the audience, they don't just want to hear about Spitfires and Arnhem and the Battle of Midway. The, the sinews of war uh, and, and how it was all funded and how stuff was made is just as interesting because, as we found out, it doesn't matter how many tanks you've got at the front. If you can't replace them with brand new ones, if you can't keep them repaired and maintained, you can't keep the battle going. But since we last spoke, what have you been up to? Well, I'm actually working on a new project, uh, which is about the post-war period in the Soviet Union. So that's been really interesting to me, the period from 1945 to 1953 with Stalin's death. Brilliant. And as we talked about last time, I mean, with, with the study of the Soviet Union and Russia, of course, you can't avoid the fact the world is in a very different place in regards to what Russia is doing in Ukraine. And so how how people will be accessing archives information over the next decade or two is is up in the air. How, how are you how are you finding it in terms of just getting into the archives and finding information? Well, it's impossible now for people in the West to go to Moscow to do work in the archives not because Moscow is closed or because the archives are closed, but it's just extremely difficult to get in. And of course, the universities in the West are not funding any of that research anymore. Uh, so that it's kind of put a lid on all of that. And um, I don't know where we're going with the war in Ukraine, but uh, at this point, you know, as far as everyone seems to understand, we're somewhat at a stalemate. And my mm. hope is that peace or some kind of negotiations at the very least will begin to come out of this. Well, absolutely. And it doesn't prevent us, the, the, despite the horrors of what's going on today, it doesn't mean that we still can't examine the events of 80 years ago when the Soviet Union was, whether we like it or not, they were an ally, they're a part of the war effort and the study of what they were achieving back then is still relevant. So anyway, you've come on with a PowerPoint. We'll, we'll take us, uh, you'll take you through it in a minute. So folks, we'll kind of deal with questions that refer to a particular facts and things Wendy is saying as we go along, any kind of bigger questions about Wendy's research or the Soviet Union or as a, a wider concept, we'll kind of save those to the end. But I'm going to hand over to Wendy now to take us through this, this, this mobilization and industry and factories. So over to you, Wendy. Okay, well, let's get started. So today I'm going to be talking to you about workers and the labor system in the Soviet Union during the war. And most of this material comes out of the Soviet archives uh, in Moscow and is actually largely unknown to Western audiences, even I think to military experts. And I know we have a lot of people who know a lot in our audience, which is great. So workers, uh, as Paul alluded to, uh, and as we all know, are essential to any war effort. They produce the armaments that supply the soldiers on the front lines. Without workers, it is impossible to put a fighting force in the field. So even military experts, I think, have got to be uh, interested and aware, not only of how and where those armaments are produced, but also the level at which they're produced and the factors that uh, impact their production. So my talk today, um, <coughs> excuse me, is based on my book with Donald Filzer, Fortress Dark and Stern, The Soviet Home Front During World War II. And this is the first archivally based book on the Soviet home front in the West. So it has a great deal of new information that we have never seen or used before. Now, we often think of home fronts as geographically static in comparison to military fronts which are constantly in motion. Yet in the Soviet case, nothing could be further from the truth. The two fronts moved in dynamic relationship to each other, 
the home front contracting and then expanding, first as the Germans occupied more and more territory, and then after Stalingrad, as the Red Army liberated the occupied regions. So Paul, let's just hold on this slide for a minute. This contraction and expansion had two enormous impacts on the policies of the state and on the experiences of the people. First, the government made the unprecedented decision to evacuate the industrial base from west to east, which was an enormous undertaking that had never been accomplished by any wartime state. And second, the government then had to adopt policies to staff the industries that had been evacuated to the sparsely populated East. So we have here now up on the screen, a frontline map that takes us to December, 1941. And I hope everybody can see that or at least get a general sense of it. So after the invasion, which we know takes place on June 22nd, 1941, the Soviet state actually moves very, very quickly on the home front, which is interesting because, let me flag this, the policies on the home front, which were adopted rapidly, stand in contrast to the military debacle that was unfolding on the front lines as the Blitzkrieg rushed in and the Red Army fell back in disorder and disarray. Within two days of the invasion, the government had created a new body and it was called the Soviet for Evacuation. It was responsible in its first charge for rescuing machinery, people, grain, cultural treasures that were under threat of either occupation or of bombing. So that was the initial charge. Now, if we take a look at the map, we can see, and this is something, of course, I think everyone here knows, that the Germans moved fast. Mm -hmm. We can see how much territory fell under occupation. We're looking at the first six months of the war. So just to sort of sum up this first six months for us, by December, 1941, Bielorussia, Ukraine, including the steel plants in Zaporozhye and Dnepropetrovsk, two very important places for us on the Dnieper River and the Donbass mines, also extremely important, a large swath of the Russian Republic along with Crimea, had fallen under occupation. This is where most of industry was concentrated. Leningrad in the north was surrounded in what would become the longest running siege in modern history, in which almost one million people would starve to death. On a clear day, by the time we reached December, the Nazis could see Moscow with a good pair of field glasses. So you can take a look. I think all of our listeners can find Moscow on the map. Uh, it's the little starred city there, um, right in the middle of our map. And you can see how close the Germans mm -hmm. were. In this same period, okay, the Soviet for evacuation rescued up to 17 million people and 2,600 industrial enterprises from territory that was soon to be occupied by the Nazis. This encompassed about 22% of the population and about 37% of the pre-war value of the industrial enterprises, which is a better indice. So for example, you can have an enormous enterprise, which is very, very important. Like for example, um, a steel plant in Zaporozhye, uh, rescuing that uh, figures into a percentage of pre-war value, but it doesn't figure, it only figures as one factory or one combinat in the, uh, uh, in the list of numbers. So the, the percentage value is really what we need to look at. Um, Paul, can you go to slide three? 
So this is a painting and um, it's an artistic rendering of equipment from a Leningrad uh, defense factory that is being loaded onto boxcars for shipment to Kazan. And then if we go to the next slide, what I love about this uh, set of two paintings is that this is the same factory now that is being unloaded from the boxcars in Kazan to be set up. And then finally, I'd like to take you to a photograph, which is the next slide, which gives you a sense of now, this is equipment that's arriving from Kiev and it's arriving at Uromash Zavod, which is um, a machine factory in uh, Sverdlovsk. Um, and this is a machinery that's now arriving and you see sort of what this all looks like uh, now, not in an artistic rendering, but rather an actual photograph of the period. Uromash Savod, I will say, um, becomes one of the major tank factories in Sverdlovsk. It produces large scale tank components and uh, helped to produce uh, the famed T-34 tank, which many of uh, our listeners may be familiar with. So here we see this in a photograph. Now, what we're looking at, as we look at, there's something that strikes us, I think, quite strongly in both the paintings, if you wanna just go through these three again, and in the photograph, which is what we're looking at here is a remarkable amount of human labor hauling stuff by hand. All of the horses, the cars, the trucks, and other things had been commandeered from the home front to the front. So what we're looking at here, which is human haulage, human labor in all of these cases becomes a hallmark of life on the home front. So for example, in the factory canteens, which fed literally millions of people, wood was cut in the forests and then dragged back to the canteens on sleds or sledges uh, by human beings. And we have this all the time, this expenditure of just very basic human labor power, which gives us a sense of how, I think, difficult uh, things were. Now, the factories were reconstructed beyond the reach of German bombers, but the Eastern towns were short of buildings. They were short of infrastructure to house and to service these factories. So often we had cases of workers literally unloading machines and beginning to run them under open skies as other workers were constructing the building that would house them, that rose around them while they were involved in production. Evacuation lasted a little over a year there was a huge push in the first six months after the invasion, and then a smaller operation in the summer and fall of 1942, as the Red Army retreated back toward the Volga and toward what would become now the historic battle of Stalingrad. Hmm. Just a quick question for you, Wendy, if you don't mind. Sure. You, you, you said how swiftly the Soviet Union responded you know, after the invasion to this plan there. I'm assuming at the same time, the kind of the, how they were going to sell it to the public began at the same, you know, the, at the same time, because, you know, we talk with Mark Wilson, yes, the other shows is that it's all very well, the government stepping in saying, we need to do this in a war environment. You kind of got to get the people on board now. Okay. It's a communist state, so they don't necessarily have much say in it, but, you know, I'm thinking of the, you know, the, British housewives giving up their frying pans to make spitfires. Were the, were the people of the Soviet Union kind of behind this initiative and, uh, immediately, or did they have to kind of be pushed into why, why it was important? I think that this is a really important question. Without the cooperation of workers who actually risked their lives in many cases in order to dismantle the factories, 
they were often literally a few days ahead of the invading forces. So they were dismantling the factories, sometimes under bombing, the uh, areas were being bombed, workers would rush out of the factory and then they would come back to finish packing up the machinery. The railway stations were being bombed constantly. So they were often loading under bombardment. In the case of, um, uh, I believe it's uh, Zaporozhia, there was a dam that was blown by the Germans and there is this massive flooding that takes place. So there are fires, bombs, floods, Without that kind of heartfelt, wholehearted cooperation, none of this could have mm. occurred. So yes, um, it's uh, in many cases, uh, not only giving up frying pans, which doesn't result in the loss of life, right? Mm. Uh, just one pan short, but um, it actually, people were dying in this effort. And, um, there was so much chaos, I think, and so much um, need for uh, people to sort of step up to really take, you know, this into their own hands in many cases, that a, something like this could not have been handled uh, given the circumstances under just sheer repression. It would have made no sense at all. Um, it would not have worked. So yes, um, there's a lot of cooperation in all of this. Thank you. And then I was just talking about the two phases of evacuation and the second phase that takes place as the Red Army retreats back toward the Volga. After the victory in Stalingrad in early 1943, evacuation is no longer necessary. So this phase of the war is now over. And what we have now is the opposite process. So after Stalingrad, as the Red Army now begins marching west, and of course we know the war's not over, many battles will still need to be fought, but as one area after another is liberated, what we then have is the opposite process begins, which is that workers now begin moving back into the devastated occupied air, previously occupied areas or newly liberated areas to reconstruct. Um, the uh, devastated industry. So we begin to see that uh, second thing. Okay, so, uh, let's take a look at slide six. So what we're looking at here is a uh, teplushka. And what this is, is a box car. We're looking at the inside of the box car. Most people who were evacuated were evacuated in teplushki. These are railway cars, box cars, uh, without seats, without luggage racks, without toilets, or even the most basic sanitary facilities. So you can see here um, that this is what existed. And people were often on these journeys for many, many weeks. The Teplushki though were heated, which of course made life possible. And uh, you can see the metal um, barrel in the center with the pipe coming up through the roof of the box car. Uh, they were heated either through wood or through coal. This is a reconstruction of one, so you see both. And you can see the pail of coal and also the um, uh, stack of wood uh, that was used uh, to heat it. Now, let's go to slide seven. Here we have uh, people entering uh, boxcars uh, for evacuation. And I think it gives you some sense of just what this looked like. So this was an organized evacuation, but at the same time, you know, as I mentioned to you before, uh, the rail lines were frequently bombed, the stations were bombed. So you can also get a sense of, I think the chaos and the difficulty and just what it meant now for all of these people, crowds, hordes of people, uh, with children, uh, with luggage, with sacks, um, with elderly people, with sick people, uh, trying to enter uh, these boxcars and then entering them uh, for very, very uh, long journeys now to the east. Now, these organized evacuations, and what you're looking at here is an organized evacuation, were accompanied by vast streams of refugees along the roads. So in other words, people that did not have the opportunity necessarily 
They were far from a railway station. They were not part of an institution that was being evacuated. Uh, people just began streaming east uh, along the roads. And um, these journeys were very perilous. Trips that might have taken several days often stretched into many weeks or even months. The Germans constantly bombed the rail lines, which meant that trains had to either stop or they had to organize elaborate detours. Family members, due to the lack of sanitation and also the fact that, you know, this is not a young group of healthy soldiers mm -hmm. that are riding in these cars. These are people, pregnant women, um, nursing women, elderly people. I mean, imagine taking your whole extended family into a boxcar. You've got people in all ages and stages of health. So people frequently fell ill. They had to leave their convoy and get off at a town, hopefully to get treated in a local hospital. And so as a result, we have the category of official evacuee and refugee, those categories broke down in mm. the course of movement from west to east. As people left the convoys, people were able to join convoys. People tried to um, find family members and hook back up with them. And so we have refugees and evacuees. All of them are mingling now amid the chaos of war making it very difficult, I think, to separate one category for an from another. Although there were important ways in which the categories were different, and I would be happy also to talk about that after the talk, if somebody would like to discuss what did that difference mean. Mm -hmm. And we have just uh, various people in the sidebar asking about the workers and whether they move, whether it was voluntary, whether they moved the entire communities. I think you kind of address some of these dark things, but to give an uh, example, um, Rob Crane is saying, did factory workers shift their own factories? And then Kevin Jones is saying, where were the workers forced or was it a voluntary move to the east? So so kind of break down, there, there's a factory producing, let's say it's um, um, tank parts and, it's, and, it's, and it, it needs to be moved to the east. Did that was it the whole complex move? Is everybody from from the gen company director down to the workers and the, all their wives and children? Was it voluntary? Kind of explain how it how it worked. Good question, and I'll cover a little bit of this as we go forward. Okay. But let me just address it right now, um, in terms of its details. The planning for evacuation was done by the Soviet for evacuation, so it wasn't just as if a bunch of workers got together and voted and said, "Let's move now." Yep. Um, as you think about this, you realize it's got to be coordinated with the railways and the railways are moving east. Uh, they're moving east with um, uh, evacuated uh, loads and they're also moving west with soldiers and equipment. Uh, and they're also moving around just to supply the country with basic goods. So this is an enormous process of railway coordination, and this emerges from the archives. Uh, second, uh, any railway line cannot bear more than a certain amount of traffic without reaching gridlock. We've all been in gridlock in cars, but unless people know something about railway lines, which a lot of people do not, railway lines are also subject to gridlock. That's a mathematical number that is worked out by railway specialists. How many trains can be on a particular line at any particular time without creating gridlock? So no, it was a decision that was made by the Soviet for evacuation, and it was made in uh, two ways. One was emergency evacuation, and that was a little bit of what I began describing at the beginning yeah. where they are literally two, three days ahead of the Germans, right? I mean, they're not controlling the invasion, right? They're controlling evacuation, but those two things are so closely wedded together. So there are emergency evacuations that take place. And then there are also planned evacuations that take place, which is well in advance of the German front movement. Mm. So we've got both of those. And then on top of that, as you said, you've got refugees just kind of piling on because they're seeing an opportunity. So, so sort of various levels of, of, of organization sort of, as you say, pre-planned, 
kind of steady organization, emergency evacuation, and then anybody else who's living in the area who just wants to get the hell out of Dodge. That's right. Now, evacuations occurred, they handed out um, when a, a institution, it could have been a university, it could have been a factory, it could have been a, a healthcare center. Evacuations um, were planned and then the institution distributed tickets for the railways. Uh, people were allowed to take, they, they went, the people that worked in the institution plus their families all got tickets. So you couldn't just show up at an evacuation, a planned evacuation, and just get on a train. You got your tickets collectively through your institution, through your work institution. That's how it happened. Um, was it voluntary? Well, a lot of uh, young people in the factories had already been drafted and were headed to the front where they had volunteered. So immediately the factories lost a large number of their, um, I would say, healthiest, youngest, uh, strongest uh, population was drafted and headed for the front. Many of the skilled workers, however, uh, were asked to stay back and did. Um, and they then frequently traveled with the machines, uh, with the dismantled machines, sometimes even in the same boxcars to their final destination. So people were told, you know, either you're being, you're going to the front, people are drafted, or else um, you're going to accompany the factory. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there were cases with families where there were all sorts of desperate discussions that were held. So let's say a worker, a man or a woman might have known he or she was headed to the front, but would mama and papa come? Um, would uh, the grandparents come? What about an aunt or an uncle who was sick? Um, would people be left behind? And there were big dilemmas in families over what to do. Now, many, some of these areas had been under occupation uh, during World War I. And the Germans at that time, well, we were dealing with a completely different kind of occupation. So many people had memories, the older population, of the Germans as being fine people. I mean, there was a war, it's true, but these were not Nazis. They didn't even understand what Nazis were. So for the Jewish population, those people who chose to stay behind or were unable to leave, we know what happened to them. I mean, they were annihilated. Uh, and likewise for many other people as well. So let's just say we need to kind of put ourselves back in the heads of the people at the time. They don't have the knowledge that we have now looking back. Thank you. So let me just say the evacuation of the industrial base was an absolutely audacious feat. I cannot exaggerate this enough. Um, it was unprecedented in the history of warfare. Never had any state succeeded in rescuing such a massive industrial base and then transporting and reconstructing it thousands of miles away. Alongside, it's not just industry, millions of people, tons of grain, food stocks, even herds of cattle and pigs and poultry were evacuated. So this is a massive effort. Uh, slide eight. And here we have what has to be, I think, one of my favorite photographs because it gets not only at the job and the work, but it also gets a little bit at the sense, I think, of determination, difficulty. Um, you take a look, and of course, female labor, which is what we're looking at in many, many cases. So I don't know how long this particular railway worker had been on the job, but when you take a look at her face, I think you can pretty much guess um, the exhaustion, the grimness, the sense of um, necessity in moving this machinery out. Uh, so evacuation requires great organizational coordination by the state and industry and equally great courage by the industrial, railway, and construction workers who make it possible. And I talked a little bit about some of that courage before. It was made necessary by military defeat and territorial loss. So it's a great feat that's actually made possible by a great 
defeat initially, but it's ultimately the achievement that enables the Soviet Union to continue to produce the steel, the coal, and the armaments that it needed to win. However, and here's where we come, I think, to the heart of our talk today. Evacuation carried with it huge consequences that no one could have predicted when the war began. And the reason they couldn't have predicted it was because they had no idea how much territory and how much material was going to have to be evacuated. In other words, no one had a crystal ball and said, this is what the frontline mm -hmm. map is going to look like come December of 1942. All right. Nobody knew. And it was totally contingent on the battlefield. So just to give you an example, in June of 1941, 18% of the defense industry is located in the East. That's pretty small, 18%. One year later, June 1942, 76%. Wow. The vast bulk. And although many of the factories were evacuated with their workers, which we just talked a little bit about, um, many of the original labor force went to the front. They needed those people in the Red Army. Of course. And the Eastern towns were sparsely populated. These were not large population centers. So what did this mean? It meant the government was now going to have to recruit a labor force from afar. Now, let me stay with this point a little bit. All of the combatant countries faced a shortage of labor. And I think we, you've been doing a series on this, yeah. Paul, right? But none of them so acutely as the Soviet Union. And all of them chose different paths to fill the shortages. So, for example, the United States and Great Britain staffed the defense plants with voluntary waged workers, including women. But it was possible to do that staffing with volunteers. Germany, we know, used slave laborers. 5.5 million people from the occupied territories, as well as the concentration camps, as well as the ghettos, uh, were used as slave labor by Germany. And Germany was committed to keeping German women out of the workforce. We know that Japan also used slave labor. Korean and, Japanese, and Chinese uh, civilians were used. Only in the Soviet Union was the entire able-bodied population, including women, subject to a labor draft that was analogous to the military draft. So on June 30th, 1941, and remember in the beginning of our talk, I said that the government got organized on the home front very effectively and very quickly. So here we are, we're within eight days of the invasion, all right? The government created the committee to enumerate and distribute the labor force. So from here on in, I'm just gonna call that the committee, mm -hmm. but just think about its title to enumerate, in other words, to count how many people exist in every area and to distribute the labor force, the name of this committee. Initially, its tasks, just like the tasks of the Soviet for evacuation, were limited. Nobody knew how much labor is gonna be needed. No one had any idea. How much stuff is gonna be evacuated? Nobody knew. But over the course of the war, its job got bigger and bigger. So initially, I think um, the Soviet Union, the government hoped to fill its labor needs pretty much the same way Great Britain and the United States did, um, with volunteers, uh, with housewives, with new graduates from um, high schools and vocational schools, and also uh, with pensioners, people who were retired who might come back uh, to work as well as people that were working in non-essential sectors, which are like um, municipal baths, consumer industries, uh, street cars, um, all of these things, which they felt they could pull workers from this. Um, 
I'm not sure in Great Britain and the United States whether we ever had to heavily pull from what we deemed, let's say, non-defense sectors. Um, by early 1942, it was clear that this approach, uh, which was successful you know, in other countries, was not going to fill the gap. So on February 13th, 1942, the government passed an edict. And what this edict said was that, listen carefully now, it's got a number of aspects to it. Mm -hmm. All able-bodied, unemployed, urban population. Okay, so these are people living in cities. This is not gonna touch the vast number of peasants living on collective farms. Able-bodied, unemployed, urban population between the ages of 16 and 55 for men, 16 and 45 for women, were subject to labor service, in other words, to being mobilized to work. And here's the second part, in place of residence. So you would, if you're not working in a city, you would be mobilized to work in that city mm -hmm. um, or in a town. There were also exemptions uh, for women with kids under the age of eight, uh, for nursing mothers, uh, other kinds of exceptions, um, but these were gradually whittled down over the course of the war. And like a military draft notice, it was illegal to ignore a mobilization order. So when you get your draft notice, you report to the recruiting station, and it was the same. If you were unemployed and you got a labor notice in a city, you reported to where you know you were being asked uh, to be deployed. Okay, now the edict it seems was this successful in filling the labor shortage? No. It became apparent very very quickly that two issues emerged in a big way. First, the pool of labor in the cities disappeared very quickly. There were not very many unemployed people in the cities. And by summer, actually, so by the summer of 1942, which is when the big push for production for Stalingrad, for the battle actually is, begins toward the end of that summer, by the summer of 42, the committee begins reaching into the rural population. So now peasants are being given mobilization orders for labor. Second, when we think about it, um, a lot of the mines, railroads, and construction sites, actually everywhere around the world, are often located far from urban areas. So it's not like you can wake up, go to work in the mine, and then come home to your city. It doesn't work that way. And it became impossible to mobilize people to fill these jobs and still have them live at home. So... These two aspects of the edict now are now breached. One, they're reaching into the rural population. And two, people are now being mobilized for jobs that are far away from home, sometimes hundreds, thousands of miles away from home. There is no commuting under these situations. Now, over the course of the war, just to give you a sense here of the scale, uh, altogether, the vocational schools, the draft boards, and the committee mobilized 8 million workers to permanent jobs, most of which were far from home, in industry, construction, and mining. An additional 6.7 million people were mobilized for temporary work, so cutting peat, felling timber, doing things that often they then returned to the collective farms for harvest or sowing. So how did this process work? This is like a massive control over labor that we're talking about. How did this um, work? It worked in the following way. And again, we're talking about centralized planning here. Mm -hmm. This could not have been done without a massive degree of central planning. The committee received orders from the State Committee for Defense. That's the GKO. It is the highest wartime body in the Soviet Union. They received orders from the State Committee of Defense and the industrial commissariats, the Commissariat of Tank Production, Commissariat of Chemicals, Commissariat of Construction, et cetera, 
about their labor needs. So an industrial commissariat of mining would say, we need 300,000 workers. Okay, that's the order. Um, and the committee was then responsible for establishing levies in various republics and provinces throughout the entire Soviet Union to fill these orders. So labor is becoming an input in the same way we need so many kilowatts of electricity to run this place. We need so and so many workers to make it go. At the same time that it's receiving the orders, it also created local bureaus throughout the entire Soviet Union in every republic and every province to assess the potential labor pool in all of these places locally. The levies were then received by the local Soviets. We need so and so many people, which were then responsible for meeting them. Now, a levy could range from hundreds of people. We need 600 people for blank factory in some other place, or for hundreds of thousands of people. Like a province could receive, a republic could receive a levy for 350,000 people. Um, so let's say in Central Asia, uh, in Kazakhstan, 350,000 people to be sent to the Urals. That's a long distance. Um, these levies, which ranged in size, were then repeated throughout the war. So if you were living in a province and uh, an official in a local Soviet, you could expect to receive numerous levies throughout the year, and then you would be responsible for rounding up people, delivering them to the railways, which would then in turn take them in echelons to the factories in which they were uh, going to work. In addition, let me just say that the needs of defense and its subsidiary industries were sucking workers out of all the municipal industries, including streetcars, public baths, and local garment factories. So over time, this created in the Soviet Union a total dearth of consumer goods. Everything was going to the front. And that was one of the major propaganda slogans for the time. All for the front. Um, that was not a, uh, let's say, a, just an exhortatory statement. It was a fact um, that people were living with. A total dearth of consumer goods, which was also a serious hardship on uh, ordinary people. The entire economy was stripped and scoured to provide workers and resources for defense. Slide nine. So women who were already playing a major role in industrial jobs throughout the 1930s now stepped up and became even more critical to production, as did teenagers and pensioners. Uh, elderly people. Many of the people, especially toward the war's end, after about 1943, 1944, 45, who were mobilized to work because the local Soviets had to fill those levies, were too weak, too ill, or too disabled to cope with factory work, which also is not like it is today, which is onerous enough. Um, it was 11 hours a day, six days a week, no vacations, and often overtime with a stepped up production schedule. But the mobilization targets had to be met in every province and people were rounded up all the same. Um, and they were sent on these very long and difficult journeys to work in far off towns and cities. The villages and the collective farms were stripped of able-bodied peasants and the urban inhabitants in turn, people in the cities, were then sent temporarily to help with harvest and sowing. So you have this massive labor swap that's going on within the country. And I joke in the book, I say that um, no one uh, in um, 1945 woke up in the same bed that they went to sleep in 
on June 22nd, 1941. This is a country in massive motion mm. um, and quite different, I think, in that sense from the United States was in motion too, and so was Great Britain, but not to this same extent. Um, so to give you an example about the East, after the Germans seized the Donbass mines, and I can imagine many of you would wonder, well, how did they continue to produce coal? I mean, which is utterly necessary to the defense plants. Um, the government began developing the Kuzbas mines in Western Siberia. And tens of thousands of workers and peasants were sent to do construction and mining work. When we think about it, every new mine, every factory that's reconstructed, every factory that's expanding in the East needed branch railroad lines or spur lines to the main line. It needed roads. It needed electrical lines to be run. It needed water lines uh, and electricity to be generated. So vast construction projects are being set up in the East and millions of people are needed to work, uh, to, to contribute in this way to the war effort. Hundreds of thousands of teenagers, many of them actually younger than 14, were mobilized for the vocational schools, which were hundreds of miles from home. And then after they graduated with a kind of very quick education, uh, were sent to work in the factories. So slide 10. Uh, I think if you take a look, you can see how young this uh, boy looks. What is he, maybe 12, maybe 13? Um, he's clearly, he has not hit puberty yet. Mm -hmm. And if you take a close look at the um, photograph and you look down, you can see he's standing on a broken crate on which has been placed some other kind of board so that he can reach the machine. So this gives you some sense, uh, again, of um, I think the workforce and the enormous sacrifices uh, that were being made within the country. We have millions of people now arriving in the Eastern towns, tripling their populations practically overnight. And again, think about this. Think about it in terms of refugees, and the situation that we're facing now in the world where uh, it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, cities cannot cope with influxes of refugees. We have massive problems with this everywhere. Well, the Eastern towns had massive numbers of people coming in um, and questions about where to house them, how to feed them, how to clothe them, how to give them medical care. I mean, all of these issues, how to sign them up for work. Um, the factories, the mines, and the construction sites became responsible for providing housing, bedding, canteens, daycare centers, and baths for mobilized workers. So a lot of what happens within the family, in other words, what the family provides, I think, for workers now is shifted to the site of the factory. Now just think about that for a minute in terms of the social implications of that. People ate their main meals in public canteens. There was often no heat and no fuel for private cooking. People took baths when they could, sometimes in the factories, which were the only places where there were public baths that were heated. And for the mobilized workers uh, who are coming, uh, they don't arrive with full furniture. They arrive with nothing. Sometimes they even arrived, we have workers from Central Asia arriving in sandals into um, cities like um, Sverdlovsk and other places where there's um, five feet of snow on the ground and the temperatures plunge uh, you know, below zero. So, People had to be um, fed. They had to be clothed, all of this. And let's go to slide 11. I wanted to just show you a very typical uh, document. I read hundreds and hundreds of these um, from the archives, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what's going on. 
Now, I don't know whether our listeners can read this. So let me just uh, go over it a little bit with you and give you a little sense of what it means, I guess, to be working in the archives as a historian. This is a letter. Uh, it is from the director of the Urals uh, Machine Factory. That's Uromash Zavod. Remember, we saw that yeah. um, equipment being evacuated from Kiev to um, this tank factory in Sverdlovsk. And the letter is written from the director of the factory to the secretary of the Sverd, to, excuse me, to the secretary of the Sverdlovsk Provincial Committee of the Communist Party. So this is a person who is responsible in a way for uh, Sverdlovsk city and um, province and has uh, access uh, to important um, stocks of both food, clothing, et cetera, uh, to redistribute. Often not much, but it's the person to write to. And the director of the factory writes as follows. In connection with the increase of production assignments of the factory in the second half of 1942. Okay, so folks, the targets for pr factory production went up. This is connected to the victory at Stalingrad. It is directly mm -hmm. connected, okay? The targets are going up and the workers are meeting them. Um, and the first four months of 1943. So this is what he's uh, referencing now, this period. We have accepted 4,000 mobilized workers. So they've gotten 4,000 people have arrived at the factory, uh, along with 3,500 graduates of the technical schools, the vocational schools, like that 12-year-old boy we just saw in the picture. The factory has also accepted 3,200 additional people. These are workers now with their families, okay? who have been evacuated from the Stalingrad tractor factory. That was Stalingrad factory now was producing defense stuff, which has been obliterated in the Stalingrad fighting. As you know, many of you may have seen photographs of the fighting in the Stalingrad factory. And here's the kicker. They don't have underclothes, clothing, bedding, or shoes. People are arriving without shoes. The factory, can only cover a small portion of the most basic needs of these workers, food, shoes, bedding, et cetera, which has created a very painful situation at the current time in providing workers with underwear, clothing, bedding, and shoes. We ask you to help the factory to receive these consumer goods as a matter of urgency in accordance with the attached count. We don't see the count here, but you're gonna see lists of how many pairs of shoes we need, how many mm. pairs of um, uh, sheets we need, uh, that kind of thing. Now, let me just say, um, the secretary of the Communist Party in Sverdlovsk is not sitting on a pile of anything. What he is now gonna to have to do is he's gonna to have to take from another factory or another institution or a university or someplace else, cobble together something to send to Uromash Zavod. That was the way it was done. It's not like there was some largesse anywhere. And what you often see in the archives, and um, we wrote this in the book, is that there are also these begging letters for food, workers are starving, and you just see them trying to figure out well, we can take X amount, tons of potatoes from this factory and deliver it to that factory. But it's not like the first factory that's giving it up is any more well-fed than where it's going. So in a sense, the party officials are often in the process of distributing hunger. They're literally distributing hunger rather than mm -hmm. distributing food. And this is the same thing. They're distributing clothing and you know they're distributing nakedness in a sense of uh, taking from one and and giving it uh to another um these kinds of letters the archives are just filled with them and you get a picture i think of the social experience of uh people in them so mobilized workers basically lived in hastily built barracks uh with chinks uh in the wood the wood was uncured and by the time it dried, there were big, you know, chinks in the, um, in the frames. They lived in earthen dugouts that were just dug into the ground 
uh, or sometimes they doubled or tripled up with uh, people that were already housed. So people took into their homes um, many, many uh, families. Everyone actually in the Eastern towns and cities uh, that was by law had to take people in uh, to their apartments. Uh, and this was also set by rule, how many meters per person would be allowed. In the barracks and the dormitories, uh, workers slept on three tiered plank beds that were hastily cobbled together. Looked like a bunk bed, but there were three tiers for it. Uh, and in many places, there was no bedding on the wooden planks. So they slept on that. Um, they slept in their work clothes. And I don't know if anyone here has ever worked in a factory, but you know, when you get out, um, you're filthy. Uh, mm -hmm. And your clothes are impregnated uh, with um, chemicals or with whatever you've been working with. Uh, and there was no real way to wash and people did not have a change of clothing. So people lived in this uh, stuff all the time. And you can imagine what was that was like for occupational health. In the um, dormitories and the barracks, um, there was no heat. Uh, there was no electricity. There was often no running water and there were no toilets. Many of the worst places uh, had no place even to boil water. So uh, you couldn't even get a cup of tea or something um, there. Meanwhile, the public baths and the streetcar uh, street cars had often shut down for lack of fuel. All of the fuel was being directed to the factories for production. So people walked long distances to work. Uh, they often had to walk two, three miles in um, heavy snow uh, and um, then had to walk back after an 11 hour shift. They were cold. There was no soap. And again, just talking about, you know, working in a factory, I worked in a gun factory when I was younger and there was a coolant that uh, I worked a drill press and there was like an oily coolant that um, went on to the press because otherwise the metal would have heated up so hot you couldn't have worked with it. Uh, so we were covered with coolant by the end of mm. the shift. Um, and um, in this case, uh, there was no soap, there was no way to wash. Um, people were dressed in rags. When clothing wore out, they continued to wear it. There was a, no change of clothing. Uh, they walked, they were poorly clothed and they walked to the factories in freezing weather. The factory shops were not heated. Uh, and in many photographs, I think we saw one of the woman working, she's got a hat on, she's got her coat on and she's got her collar turned up. That was because the shop was cold. It wasn't heated. Um, so yeah, there we go. Um, the uh, canteens where people ate suffered from a lack of food and fuel. Uh, many workers were actually mobilized to work in uh, tank factories or defense factories, but then they were used uh, to cut wood and to drag it back on sleds. So what they were actually doing was sort of timber work uh, in a way so that the canteens could um, heat the stoves. There were very few vehicles for factory use. In one of the uh, famed tank factories, um, uh, I can't remember, I, I think it was in Magnitogorsk, they used one of the tanks actually as a vehicle, one of the tanks they produced as a vehicle for hauling stuff. So um, you've got, you know, this, they have to make up in a sense uh, for what is, has been sent uh, to the front. Um, and many workers, workers were the most highly provisioned ration category in a ration hierarchy that existed. Workers were at the top. They were right beneath soldiers, but at the home front, they were at the top. Um, many workers uh, suffered from starvation disease and actually died from starvation. So that's how bad the food situation was. Now, let me just say, I want to talk just a couple of more things to add to this picture for you. So due to these terrible conditions, many people who were mobilized to work in distant places ran away. 
often returning to the collective farms that they had come from. And young people in particular, like the young worker we saw in the, in the um, standing at the uh, milling machine, they desperately missed their families. They were um, you know, thousands of miles from home. The conditions were awful. So we had many, many people ran away. Now we know that leaving work without permission or defying a mobilization order was a criminal offense. You couldn't do that. It's like going AWOL in the army. Uh, you can't just pick up and go home because you, know, you miss mama. Um, in June 1940, that's before the invasion, one year before the invasion, the Soviet Union began to ramp up defense production. And at this point, um, the government uh, creates a, a, some laws that unauthorized lateness or absenteeism was subject to six months of corrective labor. That usually meant you continued working, but at a reduced wage and quitting a job without permission. In other words, just taking off uh, was two to four months in prison. So they got very serious about stabilizing that workforce. In December 1941, so six months after the invasion, these penalties increased a lot. The Soviet Union had draconian labor laws. Workers in defense and defense-related industries, which by the end of the war practically encompassed everything you can think of, including textile, um, who were absent without cause were deemed labor deserters. So this is like deserting from the army and were punished with five to eight years in prison. That's a very heavy sentence. Now, let me give you some interesting figures. Between 1941 and 1945, seven million people are convicted for absenteeism. That's huge. Mm. But of that seven million, only one million actually are sentenced Okay, so six million just disappear, all right? Only one million actually receive a sentence, get to court and are sentenced. And of the group that's sentenced, of the one million that's sentenced, only 400,000 actually serve that sentence. So what does this tell us? Well, one thing it tells us right off the bat is that the law is widely flouted. We've got seven million people leaving work. Um, why? What's going on? Uh, the second thing it tells us is that only 1 million are sentenced and barely uh, 400,000 are actually serving a sentence. So it's a tiny fraction, actually, of the number that leave. So the law is widely flouted. Uh, and here's why so few people served sentences. First, the shop heads had no idea who was working in the shops. You can imagine with this influx of people, it's very, very hard to stabilize any kind of uh, labor turnover. They often did not have good attendance records. They were often having to take attendance. They would write down Ivanov. Well, there were millions of Ivanovs running around all over the place. Which Ivanov was this? Nobody had any idea. Um, so the prosecutors could not get enough data to actually put together a case. Uh, they needed to have the, the name, the first name, the last name, where the person was from. I mean, they needed to have a lot of data to put together a case. They couldn't put together the cases. The second thing was frequently the managers, the foreman, nobody even bothered to report it. The worker just disappeared. They never knew who the worker was, how long they had even been there. Um, it wasn't worth it to report it. It was just a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. So they didn't ever bother to report uh, the worker leaving. And all they needed to do was just order more workers from the comité. So if you're 100,000 short, well, let's get 100,000 more. So you're beginning now to see, I mean, already I think you can see to some extent a system that's beginning to move into dysfunction, right? People fleeing, people, the managers just ordering more, Order, ordering more from the same places that the people are fleeing back to. I mean, this is all becoming um, like a churn of labor. Um, collective farm managers, and this is very important, 
we're very happy to have people come back because they also were short of labor. So mm -hmm. it was great. Here's Ivanov. He's back, right? And he actually, you know, can stand on two feet and he's got some muscle to him. So this is something that's positive. So they frequently didn't report when these people showed up either. And people just went back to work on the collective farms. It's not like they were loafing somewhere. They were working. Everybody's working somewhere. It's just the control is not really absolute. And then finally, the judges just refused to sentence people, even when they had full case files. People often left for very tragic reasons. They got letters from the collective farms saying, you know, mama is dying. Uh, there's nobody here uh, to work, to take care of the children, to do this, to do that. Please come home. Or so-and-so, your brother has broken his leg. We're desperate. Please come home. So there were begging letters, and some of these are in the archives also, from families begging mobilized workers to return. And, you know, judges, even when they had a full case file in front of them, they just did not want to sentence people for this. And then in July 1945, after the war ended, everyone who was serving time for um, labor absence or um, you know, desertion was basically amnestied. So again, it just gives a sense that it was widely recognized that they did not want to punish people for this. So let me just now turn to some final concluding uh, comments here. Um, so in theory, the idea of knowing how many unemployed people exist in every province and republic and sending those people to work in defense industries that most needed them and um, seemed a reasonable solution, actually, for a wartime economy that's in desperate need uh, of labor and also, let's be frank, under existential threat. Uh, this was necessity in a way. Yet no society of such size and complexity ever managed to exercise that degree of control over labor, over individual workers, and certainly not in conditions where the work site was also going to be responsible for feeding, housing, and caring for the workers. By the war's end, there was no one left to mobilize anywhere. Huge conflicts existed between the collective farms and industry over labor. I just mentioned that to you about the collective farms being half. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go to slide 12. Here we're looking at um, collective farm work, uh, plowing uh, on a collective farm. And what you're looking at is women, and we've got two men in the picture and four women, dragging the soja, which is the wooden plow, which has been used since time immemorial to plow fields. We don't have a tractor here. We don't have any mechanization. Um, uh, plowing the fields with human labor power. So this is what we're down to on the collective farms. The archives are full of desperate requests from the provinces and the republics to eliminate or please reduce the mobilization levies. <clears throat> cannot mobilize any more people. They don't have them. Mm. The records, as you go through the records of the committee, show these vast lags and gaps between the number of people that the commissariats, the industries are requesting, and the numbers that the local areas are actually able to mobilize and to deliver. So this reality, I would say by 1944, is making a mockery of this incredible planning process, which is quite amazing actually. The backlogs of people remaining to be mobilized for levies that had never been met were greater than the new levies that were constantly coming in. So the local authorities, the Soviets, had no idea what levy they were actually trying to mobilize for. And the people that are arriving on work sites have no relationship anymore to the numbers that are actually requested. 
So if a factory is requesting a thousand, they're getting a hundred straggling in from a levy that's not the most recent one, but it's related to something that was uh, sent out six, seven months ago. Mm -hmm. So you can see this is a situation in which, um, how can we say, the labor system I think is in crisis. Yep. We've reached a crisis point. Um, conditions were so bad that workers kept deserting, creating high levels of labor turnover. And the industrial commissariats found it much easier to just order more workers rather than either turn to repression, which we've seen is not particularly successful, or the second way of dealing with this would have been to improve conditions uh, on the, um, in the factories and the mines. But it was impossible to do that because no factory could procure nails, wood, glass, bedding for housing, fuel for heating and baths, or adequate amounts of food. This was all being delivered to the front. So it was literally impossible to improve conditions. I would say some factories did better than others. Some were worse, some were better. But in general, there was tremendous suffering on the Soviet home front uh, throughout the war. So in conclusion, I would just say that what served the country well through most of the war, by about 1944, had taken on a destructive dynamic of its own. That said, the system worked well enough to staff the industries that had been evacuated to the east beyond the reach of the German bombers. And let's just see the last slide. Here we have women workers picking up their children after Odessa has been liberated uh, from a factory um, in Odessa. And um, I think this is a very beautiful picture. Mm. Um, but we see how these two tremendous feats, both unprecedented in warfare, evacuation of the industrial base and the mobilization of the entire able-bodied population to staff that base, enabled the Soviet Union to supply the Red Army with the guns, the armaments, the tanks, and the uniforms it needed to win the war and to defeat fascism. Thank wow. You. I mean, I'm absolutely spellbinding. And um, I fear summing it up as it worked, but it worked at a terrible human cost is, is doing a disservice <laughs> to the information you gave us. But that would be part of my one line. If I was going to sell it as a movie script, I would say it worked, but it worked at an incredible cost. And, um, we got loads of comments. Thank you, everybody. The sidebar warriors have been fantastic with the crew. We'll try and plow through some of these questions. Hopefully, they'll be they'll be fairly quick. Um, so this goes back to the evacuation. So Peter O'Connell is saying, Wendy, many of the Soviet, Soviet factories were designed in the U.S. and shipped as sub-assemblies for installation in Soviet factories. How important was this feature in shipping the factories east in that basically they were already kind of set up to be kind of mobile? Was that a factor? I think that it was a very big factor, especially going back to the workers. So when we consider that a lot of these factories had been built very recently during Soviet industrialization in the 1930s, the workers had built them. I mean, they had been the ones to, uh, you know, put this machinery into motion. They worked on it. Uh, they had set it up. They knew how to put it together and they knew how to take it apart. Um, so when it came time for evacuation, they knew what they were doing and they did it. Mm. No, thank you for that. Um, another one, um, World War II analyzer is saying, how far back from the front was evacuated? Like were places such as Penza or Tambov evacuated or did they assume the Germans wouldn't get there? Because if you try and move factories that are, that are not in danger at the expense of the ones that are in danger, you're, you're using your resources badly. So how would you respond to that? Well, you've hit on what is perhaps, <laughs> I think about the dilemmas that local officials mm. were in. So all information when the front is moving is local, okay? No one in Moscow knows exactly what's happening unless they're getting reports from the front. So you had to have reporting is coming in from the front and local officials often then had to make the decision 
uh, of whether or not to order evacuation based on local information, military and non-military, uh, and get that information to the Soviet for evacuation, which would then give the order, like move out now, um, or to wait a little bit longer. So you would think, well, why wait? Okay, well, they're desperately short of armaments in that first six month period, as we all know. Soldiers were training with um, uh, wooden uh, facsimiles of rifles because the rifles were going to the front. Um, and once you pack up a factory, it cannot produce anything. Machines and boxcars don't produce. So they also knew there was gonna be a drop. It was gonna be temporary, but there was gonna be this drop in production. And so the question, you sort of wanna wait till the very last minute, and then you wanna pack up, but you don't want it to fall to the Germans, and you wanna be able to blow the whole thing. The Soviet Union was following a policy of scorched earth. They blew everything as they retreated. So we also have stuff in the archives that's really, it's like you feel like you're there and you're just thinking, oh my God, when, when, you know, they're coming. Um, when do we move? When do we do this? And I think from the point of view of the Soviet for evacuation, but probably even more so from the point of view of um, the local officials and the factory managers, you literally had to have ice water in your veins mm. in order to make these decisions coolly and well. Um, and they were hard decisions to make. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Gordia saying, what was the casualty rate of the massive relocation? I mean, obviously with that amount of the journeys and people of different ages, is there any idea as to how many people you know, died in the process? That's a great question. And I have never seen any figures about that. Um, but I can tell you, we have a book, a chapter in the book on health, and there were two great epidemics that followed the railway lines. And I had mentioned to you about sanitary facilities. Yeah. So um, the stations were overwhelmed by thousands and thousands and thousands of people. There were no toilets, and um, there was no way for people to wash their hands. Um, so we have uh, two great epidemics in the first part of the war. There's a measles epidemic, which just has an enormous impact on the child population. I mean, it's really uh, horrific. Many children did not survive these journeys and babies in particular. Um, and we also have uh, typhus and cholera epidemics as well um, because of the sanitation issues. Um, and as you can imagine, lice uh, and other things. Now, after that first wave of epidemics though, and again, this is another, in a some sense, I guess, a testament to public health. Um, there are enormous amounts of sanitary um, uh, regulations that are put into effect that relate to both delousing and hand washing and also um, latrines. And these prove enormously effective. So after that first high death rate for both children and the elderly, all the people of middle ages as well, um, we don't see remarkably, uh, again, uh, epidemics affecting uh, the Soviet population. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, go talk about the committees, the relocation committees. Ian Curry saying, are there uh, any names we would recognize on that committee? Um, I don't think you would recognize them, but you've got, um, uh, certainly you've got people uh, on the committee who are involved with the railroads. Uh, you have people on the committee that are involved with the ration system. Uh, this would be sort of the high mid-level of Soviet leadership. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, this is really a comment, really, rather than a question. Ian Kyra is saying, never again will he say the detail on a T-34 looks rough. I mean, and I think that's it's a good takeaway. You know, uh, uh, the, the vehicle enthusiasts will talk about the, the lack of refinements on a T-34, but when you explain the nature of the factories and not having any underwear and shoes and 12-year-olds working on machines, I think we can be a little bit more um, forgiving of that. So that's that uh, interesting. Susan Yu is saying, without the war, would there be any kind of industrial changes? Would it uh, remain more agrarian? Oh, without the war. Um, I don't know. I like to think that so many positive things might have happened without the war. 
uh, I think that um, the, the the war forced a lot of uh, very rapid industrial change. So it definitely served to develop both the East and uh, a lot of Central Asia. Uh, a lot of the factories that were moved did not move back um, or parts of them only moved back. Uh, so you have a complete reconfiguration of industry. The Kuzbas becomes a major um, coal, uh, coal producing area, which we might not have had, or we might have had much more slowly and with a lot less suffering. Okay, thank you. And then I think the one from Colin Taylor, who's just around the corner from me in Bayer. Did the, any of the industry remain in the East after the war? Good question. Yes. Industry remained in the East, a lot of it. Uh, the Eastern um, uh, towns and cities remained very developed, and also Central Asia was uh, quite developed. And also people also remained in the East. So a lot of people went back, but there were also people that decided to stay. Okay, and I think we'll leave it at there. It's been absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to invite you back. We talked at the beginning of the show about the lack of um, access to the archives in the future, but I'm, I'm assuming, as the other presenters in this series have said, is that continued study in the in the economics and the factors and industrialization is important because it will help those of us that are perhaps more naturally interested in the battles and the uh, the personalities on the battlefield to understand the the, the you know the behind the scenes job. Oh, I think it's so important. And there's so much wonderful stuff in the archives. I think we've just begun to scratch the surface. Brilliant. Well, I'll let you get back to your day, Wendy. Folks, uh, that was the end of our economy series. We have uh, Mark Stilly is on tomorrow after evening talking about Japanese, Imperial Japanese Navy submarines. And then there's another World War One TV show in 36 minutes time. Lucy is talking to Rick Smith about uh, artillery on the of the BEF in the First World War on the Western Front. So you can go and switch over, have a break, to have a cup of coffee, grab something to eat and go and watch Lucy later on. So thank you, Wendy. Thank you, viewers. I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much.